Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Indeed, it's true what they say. Those of you who've been up here, I can confirm I don't see anything. Uh, I've been on stages before, but not blinded ever like this. Uh, I shouldn't be, but it's a, it's a great um, venue to do this, and I'm glad there are so many of you here for this uh, opening. Uh, my name is Roger Kyle. I've met many of you today, not all of you. I uh, apologize, we had to do a bit of the tail end of a review uh, that our funding agency, the Social Science Humanities Research Council, um, requested of us at this time. We're done with this now, and now the festivities begin. I am extremely honored by your presence, uh, by the fact that so many of you um, followed our call for papers to come to this midterm conference of our major collaborative research initiative, Global Suburbanisms, um, Governance, Land, and Infrastructure in the 21st Century. And the, bit, the little bit I was able to see today just exhilarated me uh, in the sense that I have been witnessing uh, indeed um, something new, which is that people are taking research on suburbs seriously without falling in love with the suburbs. Uh, or hating them. You don't have to have an opinion on suburbs to do research on them. And uh, I've seen a lot of that today, and we're going to continue that over the next two days. Um, we're here tonight to, to open officially the, the, the conference and to hear a keynote speech uh, by one of the most well-known suburban researchers that all of us know, and to hear the greetings from uh, people here at this university, which who I'm going to introduce in a second. Before I get there, I want to just quickly uh, say a couple of things myself. Um, I, people have said substantive things about this conference, our research project, and the work that we do. Uh, Alan Maben, Pablo Mendes in the opening keynotes, others have said uh, a lot of similar things, but I want to continue to talk about the project. Uh, I want to just quickly um, point out, uh, out uh, a little bit about the book um, that you found in your uh, conference package, uh, which uh, I'm quite proud of, uh, not only because uh, we did this in as a, what I call a catalog of the work that we do, but also that we got it done on time to be here for you to take home and to, to enjoy on your train rides, plane rides, and whatever, back or even on the subway ride back to downtown Toronto. Um, I, there is no official launch for this book because we launched it in this unconventional way of putting it into your bags. Um, but I want to nevertheless honor the moment that uh, this book saw the light of day, which is here today. So I, thanks. Thank you. I think it's a magnificent book. Uh, I stole the concept with uh, permission from uh, my friend and colleague Matthew Gandhi um, at UCL, who wrote a book or edited a book called Urban Constellations. I liked it so much that I asked him whether we could uh, use the concept and call it Suburban Constellations, and he consented and allowed me to do that. It's, I'm, you know, giving him credit for that in the introduction. And we worked with this fantastic publisher, Jovis in Berlin, uh, just a, a fantastic um, uh, publisher to work with. If you ever want to do a book like this, they are the people that, that, that you should go to. It is now in a series on urban theory in which Gandhi's book was first, and there's another book by Gandhi on its way on the acoustics of the city. But there's also a book on the way apart from this one by Neil Brenner. Um, on his new work on planetary urbanism, and I think there are people in the room who have chapters in that book too. So there is a bit of a momentum being built here by Jovis, and I would like you to recognize that. Since we didn't have the launch, and we don't have anybody you know, standing there and uh, being honored, I would like to at least acknowledge the authors so that those people who don't know the authors who are in this book to quickly raise their hand or get up, whatever they feel like. Wait, wait, Terry McGee. Pierre Mel, over there. Richard Harris, who is not here, 
Um, Pierre Fillion is not here tonight. Ute Lehre. <laughs> Douglas Young. Robin Bloch. <laughs> Pablo Mendez. <laughs> Sean Hurdle. Claire Major is not here. She had to leave. She's the one who managed the entire registration. All day, she's the woman who was behind in the code check. She had to leave to look after her little boy. So uh, I want an applause for Claire Major. <laughs> Alan Maven. Jan Neyman. <laughs> Nick Phelps. Shubra Gururani. <laughs> Fulang Wu. Louise Johnson. <laughs> Stephen Mack, photographer. And I hope I didn't forget anybody, but I also want to mention David Fleischer, if he's still around. David and the Imelda Norisa, the powerful team behind getting this book to print. Thank you, David. Thank you, Imelda, you're not here, but. So thanks a lot for contributing. I wanted to show that, so to show that it's a collective product of collective work. It's just the beginning. It's the half time of our, of our, of our um, project. Uh, by way of thanking people, I have to do that before I introduce the other speakers. Not only do I have to do it, it's a pleasure for me to do it. I want to thank all the sponsors and the people who helped to put this on. Of course, the Social Sciences Humanities Research Council of Canada that grilled us for the past two days, but I think they were quite happy with what they saw. The Canadian Urban Institute, I thank them for their assistance with the registration system, Glenn Miller and Carissa Gee. The National Film Board for present the presentation of High Rise, which I hope all of you will come back to see tomorrow. This is going to be a total spectacle. Music, film, Friday night, maybe popcorn, I don't know, but you should be here. Jerry Flahive, Katerina Zizek, Josiah Rotenberg. Then the MCR steering committee members, the researchers and the board members who have helped us come all this way. You're all here, you know who you are. I'm very grateful for, for what you've done. The MCI partners, of which you will hear more tomorrow as we launch the uh, roundtable report at lunchtime. I hope you can all be there for that. And um, the sponsors, Urban Strategies, Pino DiMaggio, also a partner. And for our strategic planning, um, Ian Shadikov, who was here just a little while ago. Ian, are you still here? And then finally, last but not least, York University in all its different incarnations. The Office of the Vice President, Research and Innovation, who've been helping us from the get-go as we had the first idea when we actually came back, and I mentioned this now, I came back from a conference in New York at, at the Hofstra Center for Suburban Studies where Robert Fishman gave a keynote presentation. He has said something there which stuck with me on the way home. It was that he said, and I hope I don't misquote you now, it's been five years or something, uh, that the urbanization process, or I would say the suburbanization process, is as important to the 21st century as the two world wars were for the 20th century. That's a big thing to say that stuck with me. It became the first sentence of our proposal to Shirk. It stuck, it worked. Thank you, Robert. Um, the Executive Learning Center, um, Paul Holland, who is the guy who runs this place and the staff in the fine arts theaters. The 30 volunteers in the conference, these are the people with a black t-shirt with that becoming little suburban revolution thing on here. The Faculty of Environmental Studies, always of great help, of which many of these students are. And the City Institute, staff and students, all the many, many hours spent over the summer organizing this, including the new director, who I'm going to introduce in a second, Linda Peake. Adam Chano can't join us today. Claire Major, I've already introduced. Assam Katam, who came to us from Amsterdam, where she's currently doing a doctoral study visit, and Frederick Peters, and several other people. 
But if all the people, of all of those people, everybody's done something, you know. But the person who worked hardest on this is Sarah McDonald. Sarah? Right here. Sarah McDonald. Right here. So she's the one who got everybody here. She's the one you can always rely on for everything. And everybody's here, Sarah, so this was good. So that's me for now. I come back in a little while, and I'm going to now ask Linda Peake to say a few words, the new director of the City Institute at York University. Linda. <clears throat> wow, it is blinding. Um, OK, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Global Suburbanisms Conference. I'm Linda Peake, and I'm the newly minted director of the City Institute. In the very short time that I've been the director, I've been aware of how much money is defining the bottom line for research centers in North American universities. <clears throat> but I want to say that there's another vital bottom line, and that is community. I think that our job in research centers is to build communities like this that bring together academics and policymakers and activists to develop research that speaks to the possibilities of urban futures. And that, in turn, speaks to the kind of people we want to be. We are indeed fortunate that the City Institute is one of the most vibrant and dynamic research centers on the York campus. We've been rewarded by having at York a large mass of urban researchers spread across the faculties of environmental studies, the liberal arts, and fine arts. In fact, last Friday night, I was with a group of city faculty and graduate students in the suburb of Markham at another project that had been put on by a York pro professor, Janine Marcheso, who was also a city member. Her project was called Landslides, and it's about art in the suburbs. So the City Institute is quite blessed with active scholars who are adept at creating communities. And they're not bad at bringing in very well-funded multi-year um, projects as well that do allow time for in-depth study and engagement. We're also fortunate to have a superb grouping of graduate students whose research interests indicate that our urban futures can be in, in good and steady hands. And I, like Roger, would like to thank the very large group of them who've been helping with many different aspects of the conference logistics. And of course, I also have to say that the City Institute would not be what it was if it wasn't for the work of our coordinator, Sarah, whose dedication to her job really appears to know no bounds. And it's a pleasure and a privilege to work with you, Sarah, to be able to work with somebody who's so knowledgeable and so capable and who, you know, you also have a great love for things urban and suburban. Roger, of course, has been the driving force behind the City Institute. He's no easy act to follow. Um, he was there at the beginning, seven years ago, and he's here now when it's turning into a globally recognized research center. And without his incredible energy and his work ethic and his determination, none of us in this community would be here tonight. But we are here. And it's truly a great pleasure to be able to bring so many learned folks together to talk, to listen, to learn from one another I sincerely hope that you'll be able to participate fully over the next couple of days, that you enjoy yourself at the conference in New York and in Toronto, and that when you leave, your thoughts and words will continue to circulate, and that among them will be the very specific words, the City Institute at York. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. I will now ask uh, our wonderful new Dean in the Faculty of Environmental Studies, Noel Sturgeon.
Welcome. Good evening. Uh, Rajay refers to the fact that I'm a new dean. This is actually the beginning of my second year here as the dean of the Faculty of Environmental Studies. And of course, one of the first things I noticed was the relationship between the Faculty of Environmental Studies and the City Institute, which is such a vibrant place, um, so much exciting work going on. And also, I learned about the MCRI Global Suburbanisms uh, Grant, which is also an incredible, uh, exciting, global effort. Um, so I really want to congratulate everybody who's worked on this. I, this is not my area of research, and I just get to enjoy hanging out, drinking wine, talking to fantastic people. Um, I don't get to go to as much as the conference as I would like, because I'm a dean, and I have to go to budget meetings. So sad. Uh, but I do want to congratulate you. Um, Linda uh, talked about community as really a basis, and for, for us, I think, the relationship between City Institute and the Faculty of Environmental Studies is very, very important. Of course, Rajay Keel is a former director and the uh, PI of the MCRI has been really important in creating that community. But as well, we have many of our faculty who are either co-investigators or collaborators with the MCR. Yute Lehrer, Stefan Kipper, Liet Gilbert, um, all the FES students who are working on this um, project and other projects, and the other FES faculty that you will run into presenting at the conference, uh, Laura Taylor, Andrew Sandberg, Gerda Wickerly. It's really um, a very important project for us, um, very central to the kind of work that we do. Um, it's funny, you know, as I was sitting there, I noticed that the slideshow, I don't know if it has it up there, it has a little piece that says, welcome to the suburban revolution, as though the suburban revolution has already occurred. And then on the conference program, it says, a suburban revolution, question mark. So it's not really sure whether that's actually going to happen. And so it made me think a lot about revolution and connecting revolution with suburbia as I came into this. You know, it's amusing to me, I, I'm a, I come from the United States and I grew up in the 60s and 70s, and for us, the idea of the suburbs was just anathema. I mean, it was a place of repressive, horrible politics, you know, um, the, the place that was trying to keep everyone from being equal, from discovering their sex, drugs, you know, all the fun things in life. Uh, so, you know, the idea was to flee from the suburbs as fast as possible and to really hate the suburbs. Um, in many ways. But here I see that when you're talking about a suburban revolution, you're really talking about a revolution in theory, to understand the suburbs as a part of the urban, as a, as a, as a force in the 21st century, as Rajay has, sent, has said, to understand the suburbs as a central aspect of the urbanism, which is involving a lot of parts of the world. So who knows, maybe the suburbs are the sites of many revolutions, or could be. Uh, especially in thinking about the interdependence of land, people, infrastructure, resources, in such a challenging time of climate change, the ravages of global capitalism, and devastating conflicts and militarization in so many communities. So I, I really find this title quite hopeful, actually. And it did make me think of the fact that that, uh, that 60s, 70s moment, for my particular generation anyway, that many of those folks who were involved in creating revolutions did come from the suburbs, and that's often forgotten. Anyway, just a little aside, uh, but I just wanted to welcome you all, welcome you to, to York, to City, to FES, and to a great, dynamic, exciting conference. Thank you. Thank you very much, Noel. I uh, will have to give you one of my spare copies of the Arcade Fires uh, album, The Suburbs, that you know about what's going on in the suburbs. Uh, before they issue their new album, The Reflector, which is due in three weeks, and I can't wait. Um, lastly, we have the ever supportive Associate Vice President, Research Innovation, Lisa Phillips. Lisa. Thank you, Roger, for giving me the privilege of a few moments of welcome remarks of my own. We are truly thrilled in the Office of the Vice President of Research and Innovation to host this public event on campus, to start to share some of the early fruits of this amazing uh, community-partnered 
uh, incredible, innovative project that really, I think, exemplifies a new research paradigm uh, that York is, is perfectly embodies York as well, really, which is all about uh, collaborating across sectors and connecting critical inquiry to social innovation. So we're really very proud to have the City Institute and the Global Suburbanisms Project here at York. And in case there's somebody who, in the audience who doesn't know, I do need to tell you that York actually has more of these kinds of large-scale community-partnered projects in the social sciences and humanities than any other university in Canada. And what it has created on our campus is a huge ferment, really an incubator of bold new thinking um, that really is going to tackle some of the key social and economic challenges of our time. And I think that this project, among others, is truly reinventing what a university can be in the 21st century. So I'm very excited to learn more about it. Can't wait to hear the lecture, and I thank you all for being a part of it by participating in the conference, and uh, thanks again for letting me get up and say some of those things. <laughs> thanks, Lisa. Um, now we're getting to the main event of the evening, and let me point out something that I really, I actually mentioned it, but tomorrow night we have a similar kind of a, a program. It's gonna be the second day, a lot of you are gonna be tired, and you've done, worked a lot, but. I can encourage you to stay tomorrow night for those two ni a night in the suburb events, the high-rise documentary screening that I already spoke about, but also the uh, panel that Shubra Gurrani has organized with you know, some of the best thinkers uh, in the room. Uh, and I don't mean myself, I've just smuggled my own way on this panel. I said, I, said, I want to be on that panel too. So they allowed me to be on it too. But you should be there, it's going to be very entertaining. There will be another sort of wine and cheese kind of thing in the uh, front of it. So please stay tomorrow night, it'll, it'll be worth your while. Um, without further ado, uh, let me get to introducing Robert Fishman, the University of Michigan. Um, he is one of those people, of course, who in this crowd doesn't need any um, introduction because we all read his stuff and it is, we've read it many times over and he influenced all of us, otherwise he wouldn't be here. Uh, he is a professor of architecture and urban planning and teaches urban design and architecture and urban planning programs at the Taubman College of Architecture and Urban Planning at the University of Michigan. With a PhD in history from Harvard University, he is an internationally recognized expert in the areas of urban history, policy and planning, and author of several books regarded as seminal texts on the history of cities and suburbs including, of course, Bourgeois Utopias, The Rise and Fall of Suburbia in 1987. It's still falling, rising and falling. Um, and Urban Utopias in the 20th Century, Ebenezer Howard, Frank Lloyd Wright, and Le Corbusier in 1977. His honors include many things, amongst others, the 2009 Lawrence Gerkins Prize for a Lifetime Achievement of the Society for City and Regional Planning History, the Walker Ames Lectureship, the University of Washington, Seattle in 2010, the Amy Lorch Professorship at the Taubman College 2006-2009, and Public Policy Scholar, the Wilson Center, Washington, D.C., 1999. And if he's in any way like me or other of the vain academics that we have, he is probably most proud of being the historical consultant and talking head for the prize-winning documentary, The Pruitt Igo Myth, which many of us have seen and shown to their classes. I want to just end on a, in an introduction of, on a personal note. Um, I did my PhD in Los Angeles and um, I had read Robert Fogelson's um, uh, fantastic book, The Fragmented Metropolis, uh, in its original version for that. And then when I wrote up my PhD um, in the English version in the 90s, I bought the book anew because I had lost it and I bought the 93 version to which you wrote, Robert wrote a, an introduction. And I recently reread it because I co-authored a, a piece on Los Angeles for this project with my friend and former students, Derek Brunel over there. And so we looked at that again. And I, I realized something, Fogelson is a classic and you treat it like that in your introduction. But the interesting thing now is that the introduction written in 1993 to Fogelson's book is also a classic because you're reading of Fogelson, this is a year after, under the impression of the LA riots. You're reading a book that was written right after the Watts riots. You're reading this book 
in that time of turmoil, and you're giving it this classical treatment, I just want to pass that on to you as an observation, that made that particularly special. So I'm looking forward to your keynote presentation. Robert Fishman. Okay, well, thank, <clears throat> me. thank you, Roger, for such a uh, for such a generous introduction, and to you and the other organizers for the invitation to speak at this uh, uh, at this uh, wonderful wonderful conference, and not least of all uh, for the invitation to speak to this audience after you've had a few drinks. <laughs> this is the kind of audience I like. So, uh, so let me uh, let me let me begin. And again, I, I probably will need a little a little coaching about how this how this device works. Let's see. What's this? Oh wait, here. Maybe this is it. Okay. Well, tell me, uh, what, is, what is the first thing you think of when you think of revolution? <laughs> right? <laughs> well, in this, in this audience, let's hope so. Uh, what I'd like to do this evening is to try to take the concept of suburban revolution seriously. And in fact, I was so inspired by the wonderful variety uh, of papers, some of which we've already heard, already heard others that we're going to be hearing in, in the next two days, uh, that I was, uh, shall we say, inspired to try something uh, that I probably should not, uh, should not try. And that is to try to construct a single narrative uh, of the suburban revolution from its origins, I would say, more than two centuries ago, uh, to the very varied forms that this uh, revolution takes today. Uh, and you know, I, I should say that such a narrative uh, is uh, impossible. But you know, I'm among friends, so I'd like to, I'd like to try. Now, I want to begin uh, in 18th century London uh, because I think that city uh, embodied not only the suburban revolution, as we'll hear in a, uh, in a, in a few moments, but really the much more uh, profound urban revolution, that is, uh, the movement of mankind from the villages to the cities really the most profound change in human life uh, since the agricultural revolution itself more than 12,000 years, years ago. And why this, you know, this, uh, and this graph explains why uh, it was impossible for cities to grow uh, significantly, to, to attain more than, say, 10 or 15% of the population of any society. The problem was that agriculture itself was so, uh, <clears throat> so inefficient, so difficult, uh, that the vast majority of mankind was essentially condemned uh, to endless toil on the land. And cities could grow uh, only as what Patrick Geddes would call Tyrannopolises or parasitopolises. In other words, they could grow only by somehow engrossing, exploiting, seizing, uh, the, seizing the wealth of others uh, through conquest. And this lasted. This worked as long as, as long as it worked. And so every such Tyrannopolis and parasitopolis was do, uh, was finally uh, doomed to destruction. 
Now, this begins to change in, in the 18th century, not only with the Industrial Revolution, but perhaps even more with what is sometimes called the, the new agricultural revolution, the change in uh, the transformation in techniques of agriculture, the transportation revolution that opened uh, cities like London to the, uh, products of, to the products of the whole world. Uh, the, the limitations, the seemingly inherent limitations on the size of cities we're now, uh, we're now being overcome. Population was rising uh, dramatically, but, but for the first time in human history, food supplies were rising even more quickly. So as a result, uh, cities could grow as they could, never, as they could never grow before. That is the essence of this urban revolution. Uh, and you know, with growth came that you know, unique dynamic of the, urban, of the urban economy that Jane Jacobs, for example, understood so well. The energized crowding that creates uh, and fosters innovation. So city growth fed on city growth. First one had, of course, the uh, London, the first million, uh, city of a million since, uh, since, ancient, since ancient Rome. New York, uh, a century later, five million, six million, seven million people. Tokyo, 25 uh, today, 25 million. Uh, and now, of course, we're reaching that climactic moment, really, in uh, really in human, you know, in in the human history of our time. Uh, the final draining of the great reservoirs of village population in Africa, Asia, Latin, Latin America, uh, uh, into, into, the great, into the great cities with the corresponding uh, transformation in the scale of urbanism itself, such as the world has, ne has never seen. Now, in this context of the, of the urban revolution, uh, London, as I say, London was the starting point. And it was there uh, that, you know, that the, with, with growth, with continuing growth, what, you know, what happens is that the outskirts of the city uh, suddenly attain a new meaning. Uh, before, you know, when cities grew slowly and episodically, uh, the, urban, you know, the urban periphery uh, could, in effect, be left to the marginal members of the society, uh, to, you know, to people who wish to escape the notice, the control uh, of, the city, of the city itself. But now, with growth becoming uh, the essential element of the modern city, this land, uh, in close proximity to the urban core and yet open, relatively inexpensive, this, the whole meaning of the periphery changes, uh, undergoes this, re, uh, this revolution uh, as, you know, as growth continu you know, continues. So instead of this periphery becoming, you know, as I say, simply a marginal element in, in the city like London, uh, it becomes the great resource, uh, the great resource for growth. And the key issue is, who controls this, uh, this land? Who, you know, who, who seizes on this land and, and, uh, and makes, it, makes it their own? Now, uh, as I, you know, in my interpretation at least, uh, essentially it's the London upper middle class, the bourgeoisie, uh, who uh, inspire, you know, not only are they fleeing, the uh, disorder, the, uh, the disease, the crime, and so on of, of, this rapidly of this rapidly growing city. But they're also seeking in a more positive way to create a new environment, a new environment for the middle class family, a new environment for, uh, for women and, and children, where their uh, purity, as people believed it, would be reflected in the purity of nature itself. And so 
and, and this was, you know, this was the suburban revolution in its initial in its initial characteristic, the transformation of the villages at the outskirts of London uh, into what I call the bourgeois utopia, using uh, such as uh, the open land, such as Clapham Commons, as the center for a, uh, for a new kind of community of prosperity at the edge, uh, a, new, a new landscape. Again, it doesn't, this doesn't look very revolutionary to us, uh, but behind these uh, beautiful houses on Clapham Common, owned by some of the richest merchants and bankers in London, was, I think, a true revolution in, in urban form, uh, that the upper middle class had lived and worked in the center. Now one had, for the first time, this division uh, between family life and work. Uh, the two occurring in different locations and totally, in, in totally different uh, environments. And more than this historic division between family life and work, there was this creation of a new kind of environment, a marriage of town and country, so a place that was neither urban nor rural, but had that character of, of both. And with this, I believe, the, urban re the suburban revolution takes form. 1823, the architect John Nash gives it uh, a kind of uh, design language based on picturesque architecture, on historicist, uh, <clears throat> on historicist design, uh, a design language that can define this uh, new concept of this new concept of the edge can be used for development, for rapid development of this kind of suburb. And taken, you know, taken one might say to its uh, you know, achieving its greatest uh, uh, elaboration by Frederick Law Olmsted uh, in his great plan for Riverside, Illinois, outside Chicago from 1868. And when, when uh, Olmsted was reflecting on Riverside, on this growth of uh, middle-class suburbs of privilege at the end of this fastest grow, at the edge of this fastest growing uh, uh, city, in the, city in the whole world, he had this very interesting thing to say. It thus becomes evident that the present outward tendency of town populations is not so much an ebb as a higher rise of the same flood of urbanization the end of which must be not a sacrifice of urban conveniences, but their combination with the special charms and special substantial advantages of rural conditions of life. And I think the key here is that, uh, that concept, the suburb is not an ebb in the process of, of urbanization, uh, it's a higher rise of the same tide. It, it, suburbanization is urbanization. Urbanization uh, at its at the edge at its strong at its strongest point, and even though the suburbanites uh, might think of their suburb as somehow different from the city and opposed to the city, they are part of this urbanization process. And you know, if it's a suburb of poverty and so on, as we'll see, if uh, the people in the city regard the people at the edge uh, in a slum or favela or something as not part of the city, they are wrong too. This is the uh, suburbanization is urbanization. It is the same, uh, it is the same process. And as we see in Chicago, uh, a, a characteristic form emerges for the modern industrial metropolis with uh, the loop, the great you know, uh, density downtown then uh, the, uh, fa the dense factory zones, the real productive heart of the city, and finally at the edge, the bourgeois utopia, Oak Park, uh, in this case, uh, this uh, expanding realm of prosperity, privilege, and, un and union with nature. And simultaneously, though, with this uh, with this form, another uh, form was uh, you know, was taking shape. This time, uh, most mostly in Paris, where you have you know, thanks to the uh, uh, 
profound rebuilding of the city led by Louis Napoleon and, uh, and Baron, Baron Hosman, uh, you had uh, a middle class zone of privilege emerging in the center, uh, in the core of the city, uh, based on the great uh, Hausman era apart, uh, apartment houses, the great boulevards uh, that now define, you know, define Pari the Parisian bourgeois utopia. Uh, and correspondingly, the poor are pushed to the edge. So you have you know, these two, as it were, ideal types of, uh, of, of suburban development, the suburb of privilege, such as we see in the Anglo-American context, uh, and the suburb of, the suburb of poverty uh, in Paris, where the great boulevards come to an end. And you have you know, the great city of Paris, the great city of light, was in fact surrounded by a ring of shanty towns in the 19th and early, uh, and the early, early 20th century. Uh, but what those two uh, ideal types, and of course the, the reality of, for both types of cities was much more complicated, but what these two ideal types had in common was this deep reality of class division. Uh, of you know of of the uh, of you know the, the 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 bourgeois utopia was a utope, you know a zone of privilege, an environment of exclusion, uh, the inscription of class divisions on the very uh, on the very uh, structure of the great of the great city, and uh, the the person I think you know in this context who was to me the great revolutionary, uh, uh, was the, uh, the uh, utopian planner Ebenezer Howard. And you see his book, Tomorrow, later known as Garden Cities of Tomorrow, uh, from, from 1898. Uh, Howard, I should say, was my kind of revolutionary. Uh, he was, you know, he was, by trade, he was a public stenographer who, uh, who, wrote, who wrote utopian books. And uh, uh, you know, but but through the you know this remarkable form of advocacy, uh, he raised, I think, the key questions about the suburban revolution, about uh, about the suburb, that still uh, are, I would say, the key uh, the key questions today, because uh, you know Howard asked a kind of uh, a kind of basic a kind of basic question. The you know the the land at the edge of great cities with its uh, uh, its beauty, its its relative cheapness and so on. This is a great resource for the whole society. Is it possible uh, to design uh, a better form of suburban expansion, uh, one that combines uh, <clears throat> efficiency, beauty, and social equity? that brings all these things together. And he asked another important, another critical question, and that was uh, the question of who benefits. Who gets, uh, you know, any time uh, land at the edge is converted from agricultural use to building plots, there's a tremendous rise in value. And who gets that, you know, who benefits? And is it possible for, uh, for uh, the community as a whole to benefit from this process of, suburbaniza uh, of, of suburbanization. Those were the key questions that he, uh, <clears throat> that he asked. And uh, you know, his, his answer uh, embodied, embodied in the Garden City, and, you know, to, uh, and his, you know, if I might uh, express it in terms of current planning, uh, is, you know, that, the, the proper way of suburban expansion is through clustering at the, at the edge to preserve, you know, to create a, uh, a walkable, dense, urbane community close to nature. Uh, it would be mixed income rather than the uh, suburbs of poverty or the suburbs of wealth. There would be uh, room, room for all. It would be mixed use so that uh, their, you know, people could live close to their, to their, to their work again. Uh, and it would be connected 
by transit uh, to the central city and also to the other uh, garden cities throughout the region. The central city would be surrounded by a perpetual green belt. In other words, the, the beauty of the natural environment would be protected and you would have a new form of social equity uh, besides. And I would say, just observe, observing this, that if you believe in planning at all, I think you have to believe in some version of Ebenezer Howard's approach to the suburb. We have different names for it today, transit-oriented development, smart growth, uh, <clears throat> walkable neighborhoods, and so on. I think it all comes out of Ebenezer Howard. And it's important that he combines this with a real attention to this issue of equity and who benefits uh, from, this, from this new design. Now, Howard actually begins to initiate such places. This is Hampstead Garden suburb from, uh, from, from 1906. Uh, but it's, you know, his, his attempts are interrupted, one might say, by such things as the First World War, the Great Depression, the Second, uh, the Second World War. And it's only, I think, in, uh, in the post-World War II era that uh, the Western societies make a serious effort to really live up to uh, the possibilities that Howard had sketched out in, in, 18, in 1898. And as I analyze it, they, you know, these efforts took really two uh, two different forms. One was uh, American style suburbanization as, uh, you know, as, as, embod as embodied by Levittown. The other was the various uh, social democratic new towns programs uh, of the post-war period for mostly uh, no Northern Europe. This is one of the, the Grand Ensemble uh, outside, outside of Paris. Uh, both aiming at, you know, at this, to my mind, almost utopian goal of using that land at the edge to create a massive improvement in the lives of, or, in the lives of, ordinary, uh, of ordinary citizens. And even though, you know, in, in terms of planning history and so on, we tend to keep these apart, uh, it's important to realize how much I think looking back on it, they had, uh, they had, they had in common. Uh, the first thing, or if I might go, just go back, go back. I mean, they, you know, they were both, both essentially mass efforts, ma efforts to mobilize uh, massive, you know, massive injections of, of capital to use mass production itself uh, as a way of uh, lifting the standards of housing uh, for, for, for the people involved. And again, the, uh, you know, uh, since, you know, since the American version of this is based on private ownership, most of the new towns were at least initially uh, based on rental and government, government ownership. I think it's important to realize just how, how much these two kinds of post-war efforts uh, had had in common, and uh, we, you know, the real estate industry today in the United States tends to forget about this. But basically, the great surge in suburbanization after the Second World War uh, came out of certain government in initiatives uh, from the New Deal era, from the from the 1930s. A kind of uh, the Federal Housing Administration became a kind of think tank. In turn, and design uh, design center for somehow applying the principles of Henry Ford and Fordism uh, to the mass production of the single family house. This is, in effect, what you're looking at is the Model T of Ameri you know, of, you know of, of American housing uh, uh, designed to be ma designed to be mass produced, and even more. Uh, you'll, you'll recognize this scene, scene I, uh, I, I hope. Uh, they completely revamped the, uh, the, the structure of banking and, mortg and mortgage loans 
in order to make them in order to make them affordable. The great problem for both uh, <clears throat> for both uh, you know, U Europe and the United States was that to you know to create affordable housing you needed long-term mortgages. You needed loans at long term so they could be paid back over the life of the over the of the life of the structure. But no banker would possibly loan an individual, uh, you know, make a loan of 30 years, say. So what was needed was government guarantees. Uh, the government had to intervene and use its credit, in effect, to make possible uh, the kind of, uh, kind of long-term, low-down payment, self-amortizing mortgage that, that indeed made houses affordable. Uh, to individuals after the Second World War uh, in the process, as I say, completely revolutionizing the whole uh, uh, banking, banking system. And it was this combination of design and finance uh, that, you know, that created the uh, explosion of suburbanization, of American-style suburbanization after the Second, after the Second World War. Uh, here you see, this is uh, some famous photographs of Lakewood, California, uh, south, south of uh, the center of, of Los Angeles from 1950, the bean fields that were there, uh, the, cleared, the cleared land, uh, the, first, the first roads, and the beginning, the beginning of, of, the, of the houses, uh, laying out the frames, teams of workers would go from house to house, each one performing the same, a kind of an adaptation of the assembly line uh, to the production of housing, uh, the houses being framed, uh, the houses close to completion, and the completed community ready, to, ready for moving in. 16,000 houses uh, all of essentially the same design in less than uh, in less than two years. That was the power of this, uh, you know, of this American system. And of course, it creates uh, not only the, the sprawl of Los Angeles but uh, the sprawl of uh, of the rest of the country. Now, uh, again, you know, as we look at the uh, uh, the the corresponding. Uh, <clears throat> Socialist, socialist uh, new towns. Also, after the after the Second World War, there was the same impulse, I would say, to use the techniques of design, of mass production, of government intervention in the housing market to immensely raise the standard of housing for the mass of uh, of, of of the people for the mass of the people of Europe. Of course, this was socialism, so there was much more planning, uh, much more coordination, uh, the, the famous Abercrombie, the famous Abercrombie plan that in, you know, in perfect uh, Ebenezer Howard fashion tried to, you know, tried to create a green belt around, around the city of London uh, to, in effect, uh, create a monopoly of, uh, of housing production and community building. In that outer outer ring, so that planning could take place uh, without these uh, new towns being overwhelmed by uh, sprawl type by sprawl type growth. Uh, as you know, here here is another version of that of that ideal. Uh, and that the other issue uh, again coming out of Howard, uh, what we you know, the the uh, coordination. Of, tran of transit and land use, transit-oriented development, as we see here in the famous Finger Plan of 1947 uh, for, for, Cop for Copenhagen. So this was far more planned and directed uh, than, than, than the American system. And, you know, but, and instead of being based on home ownership, Essentially, the, govern, you know, the governments of Europe used their power to borrow uh, at long term. They then made similarly low cost long term loans to building cooperatives and usually other nonprofits that would build the kind of housing and the location they wanted to see. 
and uh, then offer this housing to, to rent, uh, for rental. So it was a rental system instead of, a, instead of an ownership system, but still one uh, that reflected these larger ideals of improve, improving uh, uh, people's life, creating housing in the quantities that, were, that, was, uh, that was needed. Uh, and I'll, go, <laughs> I'll stick with that for, 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 for a moment. Uh, the, you know, the issue, you know, and, and I would say of this, this era uh, that uh, uh, we, we, we tend to perhaps overlook its, uh, its virtues. Today, you know, both the American system of individual home ownership and the, the European system are in crisis for, uh, for, for different reasons. Neither of them was able to withstand the corrosive effects of, uh, of of, neo, of neoliberalism, uh, neither, uh, neither was was able to uh, to you know, to withstand the effects of unrestricted speculation, the boom and bust cycles that virtually destroyed uh, the world economy uh, in two thousand in two thousand eight, and still have not been remedied. And finally, there is of course this issue of sustain of sustainability. Uh, the uh, the results, the ultimate results of this kind of this kind of growth, especially in uh, in in the in the United in the United States, we're now uh, this this is this is Connecticut, uh, and uh, is this is this urban is this suburban? Uh, this is the kind of growth that uh, you know that 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 we've seen over the last 50 years. Uh, anyone care to take a guess where this is? Paris. <laughs> I mean, this is Paris. This is the real Paris, the Paris where most uh, where most uh, people in the Paris in the Paris region in the Paris region live. So, uh, this uh, this issue of uh, of growth of sustainability is, of course, a major one, and there's so much more to be said about it. But uh, what I'd like to do this this evening instead. Uh, is to move, you know, move, move, move instead to what I see as the real suburban revolution of our uh, of our time, which is not so much what's happening in the developed world, uh, but what's happening in the in the un underdeveloped world. Where, as I say, as I've said, we are now reaching this climax of the transformation of mankind from. Uh, being based in villages, living from agriculture to an, ur you know, an urban lifestyle. Population is projected to rise, the world population from 6 billion to 9 billion. Almost all of it will wind up, almost all of these 3 billion people will wind up in these, you know, in, uh, in these immensely crowded, disorderly cities of the, of the developing world. And that was what I meant when I said to Roger, this is the challenge of the 21st century, uh, equivalent to the challenge of the world wars and totalitarianism of the 20th century. Uh, will we be able, this, uh, this movement to the cities cannot be stopped. Uh, it's, you know, it's, uh, it will occur, it will reach its climax during, during a period of global warming, of resource exhaustion, of failed states, uh, will you know? Will humanity be able to survive uh, this you know this challenge? And there are different responses. Uh, you know, I'll go go through a few of them. The one you know, the the middle class or upper middle class uh, 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 trying to escape into their uh, bourgeois utopias. It's still out there. Uh, this is a place called Rancho Santa Fe, Rancho Santa Fe, Shanghai, and uh, you know the, uh, the the different versions, fragrant hills above Beijing, uh, for the for the one for the one percent. So this impulse to escapism to gated communities uh, still is still very much there. Alphaville outside Sao Paulo in Brazil. 
uh, you know, it's one of the most massive uh, gates. You know, here, here is some serious, this is medieval type gating. Uh, but I, I don't think that response is really the, uh, the, mo the most important or the most, most typical to these issues of power, uh, of, of growth. And what I, what I see, you know, I mean, what, what, what I would propose to you this, this evening is that uh, in terms of numbers, in terms of sheer weight, there have really been two very different responses to this issue of vast urban growth at the periphery of our, uh, of our underdeveloped cities. One of them uh, is when, you know, when the state simply loses control over the edge, over the edge of development, and you have these vast areas uh, of, <clears throat> uh, uh, of slums, informal settlements, whatever one wants to call them. The other one, by contrast, and this is, you know, this is mostly uh, in, in East Asia, where an authoritarian state somehow manages to get control and to use you know, uh, the, the techniques of mass production on, an, on a scale that Europe and the United States never imagined uh, to create you know, necessarily these highly standardized, highly regimented uh, communities and new towns outside, you know, at the edge. I think I would propose that the key locale here was Singapore, because that was the, that small nation, 5.4 million today, was the laboratory where a kind of version of Ebenezer Howard, of the, uh, <clears throat> of uh, the welfare kind of sis, uh, welfare state system for building uh, moves to Asia and takes on a wholly different scale. 22, uh, since about 1970, 22 new towns have been built in Singapore, as you, uh, as you see here, a total population of more than 3.5 million. The, uh, the, the Singapore Housing Development Bureau, uh, in addition, you know, which built in many, many uh, settlements in addition, uh, infill settlements, is now estimated to have housed or rehoused more than 82% of Singapore's population. And they do this by a kind of ruthless clearance of the shanty towns that characterized Singapore in the 1950s, of the farmland uh, that was on the, on the site uh, because they monopolized development land speculation in effect is impossible. They can buy the land quite cheaply through eminent domain, uh, these massive clearances, and then as I say, this uh, unrestrained use of mass production of the high rise form uh, to house not thousands but tens of thousands and finally millions of people. In the 1980s, uh, they added a whole uh, uh, <clears throat> a whole uh, a rail, rail transit system that enabled them to attain even greater concentration, as we see here uh, in two of, the, in two of this, the, Singa the Singapore new towns. And this, I, I would submit, was in effect you know, transmitted to the, other, you know, to the rest of East Asia, Korea, uh, a, you know, outside Seoul, almost the same exact uh, uh, concept as the Abercrombie plan for, uh, for London from 1944, except again at a scale that Abercrombie and the British planners could not have imagined. And this of course is continuing in China, at least in a, in a uh, uh, theoretical way, uh, with similar concepts of, uh, of, satellite, of satellite cities and an even greater uh, uh, standardization and massive production. Look at that. <laughs> the other, you know, and, and here again, you know, what's kind of almost frightening about this is that on the one hand, you have this massive regimentation. On the other hand, chaos, anarchy, uh, in so many, in some of, so much of the informal, informal settlements, as you see as you see here. And 
Uh, I should say that uh, this is uh, Las Mayas out on a hillside outside Caracas, that uh, these were not the first shanty towns to emerge, the ones uh, of our time. Uh, believe it or not, you know, this, you know, a cluster of shanties in Shantytown, this was Central Park in New York, or the site of Central Park in New York. Virtually every government lost control of the, ed of its ed the edge of its cities in the course of the 19th and 20th century. But again, the, the scale of this 21st century urbanization is overwhelming compared to anything we have seen before. A wonderful entry from the Encyclopedie, Encyclopedie La Rousse about all the different terms, and there could be dozens of others that describe these, uh, these informal settlements. Now, uh, some of you have read perhaps uh, Mike Davis's book, Planet of Slums. And I would just say to you, if you want to be depressed, read Mike Davis, guaranteed. Uh, because he really raises some very frightening issues that, as I've indicated, somehow you know, this urban revolution has worked for mankind. The supply of food has grown even faster than population. Urban innovation has absorbed the millions of people from London, New York, and, and so on. But we can't assume that that will happen in the future. Uh, this, you know, the slums of today might really be, uh, you know, be the end, you know, might, might really mark a, you know, a, a, uh, a problem that man, you know, a, a crisis that mankind simply can't, uh, can't handle. And, you know, that is certainly uh, Davis's view, and I think it, deser it deserves to be taken seriously. But against that view, uh, I think we can, we can see, you know, there is the remarkable vigor, the remarkable immigrant vigor. Uh, and the great thing about, you know, in other words, insofar as there is anything even good about these informal settlements, is that they do liberate uh, people from failed governments, from failed states. Uh, people can, you know, they don't have to wait for government. They build it themselves, they create, their own, they create their own economy, they create their own uh, possibilities. Uh, and this might save us, uh, because the government, the government certainly, certainly will not. And I just want to, uh, you know, just, want, you know, just in, that, in that light, you know, to conclude with one, you know, just one, one particular place, uh, Sultan, Sultan Bailey, a, uh, uh, a kind of, Shanty, former shanty town city, uh, out as you can see at, at what was you know from the 1970s and 80s outside of is Istanbul on the Asian side. Uh, tomorrow we'll actually have a whole session devoted to uh, to Gebzi at the edge of this at the edge of this map uh, where the pro where this process is is taking place. And essentially, it's the strange nature of you know Turkish land law that if you can somehow put up a house and inhabit it, you know, and, you know, and inhabit it even for a day, it can't just be knocked down by the authorities. And so the story of these uh, Gechi Kandus, uh, it happened at night, uh, you know, people, you know, there, was, there was an em empty field owned by the government, uh, at the very edge of the metropolitan region. They put up these houses, they're knocked down, they try again, they try again. Finally, the government agrees uh, or allows it, allows it to be a squatter community arises. Uh, but what happened afterwards, I think, was, very, you know, was, was quite, quite remarkable because uh, Sultan Bailey somehow managed to get an urban government, a municipal government, they start to provide services. The people themselves begin to uh, upgrade their, uh, their, their own houses, their own lives, an inform, as we talked about this afternoon, a kind of informal property regime takes, uh, uh, arises so that it's possible to really invest in the, uh, uh, to build multi-story houses such as you see here. Uh, this is Silton Bailey today, a city of 300,000. And, you know, 
I don't know, you know, in other words, it's interesting to kind of compare them with, say, the, the very planned new towns of Singapore. Which one has the, the greater uh, potential for, uh, for becoming a real city? In Sultan Bailey, I might add that they've even been able, as you can, as you can see, to enforce a kind of Ebenezer Howard style green belt, uh, preserving the forests around the city and the crucial reservoirs that provide water for the city. So these two different, these two radically different possibilities uh, uh, are there. They could both fail. Uh, one could succeed, one could fail. This is, to my mind, this is the suburban revolution. This is the issue of the 21st century. So uh, you know, this edge will take different forms. This is uh, Ilsan in, in, in Korea. Uh, but I want to give the last word to, the, to, the great, to my mind, the greatest of, urban, of suburban revolutionaries, Ebenezer Howard, uh, who wrote in 1898, Town and country must be married, and out of this joyous union will spring a new hope, a new life, a new civilization. Thank you. Thank you very much, Robert. We have a few minutes. Uh, we give ourselves a few minutes. I don't know if we've been running late from the start. A question, do you want to take a seat? I think the mics are on. You said you want to stay here? Yeah, I think, I think here? I'll just stay, stay here. And if you could, I don't know if you could. Uh, yeah, as I say, yes, please. You could identify yourself quickly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, OK. Hi, um, my name is Seth Schindler. I'm from Humboldt University of Berlin. Um, I have a question about suburbanization in the global south. Um, and I think it's worth pointing out that you know, you have these two different types of suburbanization, one that's state-led and then one that happens kind of organically. <clears throat> and in some examples, uh, places that we now think of as kind of organic or informal suburbanization were originally state-led um, initiatives, so favelas and townships and so on. <clears throat> and I'm, 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 I guess the reason that those places became informal is because of resistance. For one reason or another, people resisted the state's control. So I'm just curious, can we, envision a type of suburbanization in a city like Lagos or, or Mumbai today that is state-led, that is non-authoritarian, that would not provoke that type of resistance? And if so, uh, what type of politics or what type of state action would, would that be? Yeah, yeah, well, that's, that's, a, yeah that's a fascinating and, uh, and, and absolutely, uh, absolutely uh, uh, imp you know, vi vital question. And I think that the state, you know, and, and I would say, first of all, that in my own uh, observation, and I, you know, I, 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 I ask for your, uh, you know, I, I uh, see if this accords with, 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 with your own, that, uh, that the ordinary people are doing a much better job at urbanization and suburbanization than the governments are. It's been, you know, it's been the governments that have been, you know, that have either done too much or too little. And uh, the, you know, so the, the vital thing is for a government to learn what to do. You know, as someone once said about urban design, the most important thing about urban design is knowing when to stop designing. <laughs> and it's similar with, with, you know, with governments. I think the one place I can think of where, you know, where they found something of a balance was Curitiba. In, in Brazil, uh, where the government you know, really did what only the government can do in terms of infrastructure, in terms of transportation, uh, in, ter you know, in terms of creating these basic uh, services. But, the, uh, uh, but even Curitiba, if you look at it carefully, uh, you know, we know the wonderful mayor, Jaime Lerner, and so on, but that was basically an authoritarian <laughs> Brazil was in an authoritarian phase at the time. So again, it's, you know, nothing, I mean, uh, uh, maybe others have better, better models, but uh, uh, I, I see sadly, you know, that, that our response will, you know, will take this uh, schizoid, you know, schizoid nature of too much or too little. Let's see, it's there. Yeah. 
Uh, thank you very much. I, I greatly appreciated the, uh, the presentation. And you speak a little bit of the utopias we've collected over time that have resulted in the cities that we have today. Just wondering if, if you see utopias that we have today that are going to result in the cities of tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, <clears throat> I, mean I, I say, you know, again, you know, I'm an historian, and uh, you know, you're in trouble when you ask historians about the future. But, but uh, I really think that, Evan, you know, that Ebenezer Howard is really ahead of us. In other words, that, uh, that this basic concept you know, that, that he had of cluster development, of transit-oriented development, of mixed use and mixed income, of green belts, uh, even after all that we've learned about sustainability and so forth, we can't really do better than that. Uh, it, it was just an amazing leap forward into the, uh, into, into the future. I mean, the sad thing is, and, you know, and I do find this disturbing, is that nobody has ever really built a new town <laughs> That ever you know that had quite the especially the urban the uh, urbane nature you know in other words the uh, the the true urban character that Howard had hoped and you know maybe that that part of it is impossible and you know and that again the, the traditional center city will you know that there will be a you know a a, a, a better relationship between the center city and the new towns. Than, than has existed in the past. Yeah. Given Ebenezer Howard, given I, I thought the presentation was brilliant, but given Ebenezer Howard, or your thesis that Ebenezer Howard is the godfather of all suburb, suburban conditions, how is it that today, I'm a practitioner, that every time we're in a suburban community that we have a gun stuck to our head to replicate essentially an urban condition in a suburban context. So you know we have uh, we have shopping centers which are part of a you know part of a suburban uh, type. It's Garden City, vehicular. It's very very clear building type, and all of a sudden we're forced to be placing street frontage buildings with their tail ends of the buildings facing seven lane streets because we have an urban designer. So. Could you just speak to how we've gotten so lost in this and so incredibly confused? Yeah. Well, I think the you know, the the issue with the issue with Howard and his legacy was that you know, Howard and his associates were uh, you know the the negative part, which I should have meant, you know should have added and you know and emphasized even was that they were anti-urban. They were obsessed with congestion. Uh, they saw the city, you know, they saw uh, urban density as the, as the problem. Uh, and so by the 1920s, you have uh, the, you know, the people who built Radburn uh, calling it, you know, the city for the motor age, trying to really uh, create the, this low density environment. That wasn't really Howard, you know, Howard still had this concept of, you know, of real walkable density. And you know we're just discovering, you know, or rediscovering again that you know that the the earlier form, in other words, the the form such as Raymond Unwin did at Hampstead Garden Garden Suburb, I think one of the great models for you know for uh, of you know just a, a work of genius, that that you know that that kind of uh, uh, mixture of density, variety, and openness. Uh, is you know is still I think the best model we have, and we lost that as I say with the fascination with the automobile that's finally coming to an end. Yeah, again, fabulous presentation. Thank you very much. So, Louise Johnson, and just um, recalling my reading of Howard many years ago, a few things struck me that you didn't mention, one of which is his recommendation to actually have communal kitchens and laundries. So he really did pick up on some of the early feminist ideas to kind of socialise domestic labour, which is kind of interesting that 
it's never been, well, as far as I know, it was never really kind of celebrated or, or pushed as an idea, but hey, if we're going to reinvent Howard, let's remember that one. <laughs> um, the second one is um, my understanding was that he was actually about um, communal ownership of land, not private ownership of land, and that also needs to perhaps be recalled. And thirdly, he was actually a bit of an authoritarian, as far as I could tell, in that he really wasn't all that keen on sort of a democratic governance system. He believed in the power of the expert and the rule of the expert. So he wasn't all that heroic on that front. So just your comments. <laughs> Thank you. At risk of having to change all the uh, word marks for the conference, have you thought of any other name for the term suburb? I mean, I think you yourself have said it's a very problematic term, and I think I would agree with you, but what else, what else can we call it? Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, well, I, it's true that uh, I did enter the linguistic sweepstakes uh, with the term technoverb, uh, which died immediately, <laughs> <laughs> rightly so. And you know, what's fascinating to me about a word like, like suburb is that uh, we can't invent a better one because its meaning is constantly changing. Today, you know, we just take for granted that a suburb includes an office park, an industrial park, uh, a massive shopping, a massive shopping mall. Uh, we kind, you know, in other words, the the meaning of the term has, you know, has shifted to, in effect, preclude uh, the almost the need for for a better one. Uh, what's important is just to recognize that you know that this is you know this is a word that means a whole, means something different today than it did 30 years ago and i hope that it will mean something different uh 30 years from now yeah yeah right right that howard uh yeah, yes you know he was he was he was cert he was certainly a fa you know he was certainly a, a very in interesting feminist i mean what what he did have, you know, I wouldn't call him authoritarian. I mean, did you see the picture? I mean, did he look like an authoritarian to you? Uh, more than that, I mean, he was, as opposed to someone like Frank Lloyd Wright or Le Corbusier who couldn't work with anybody, the genius of Howard was that he could draw people into his movement, like the great architect Ray, Raymond Unwin, like people who, who actually financed uh, they, you know, they, they agreed, the people who financed the first Garden City at Letchworth agreed to accept uh, a limited dividend, 5% uh, of what they invested, uh, and all the rest would then go to the community. So it was a kind of complex mixture of public and private and private ownership that only someone like Howard, I think, could have pulled off. Thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you. That was fantastic.